Uh, welcome to another Rooster Talk uh, on the Margaret River series, which is really to celebrate two years of um, SAMSO. I've got um, Brad Underwood here from Galileo Mining uh, to share some wisdom for, with us about what's happening with Galileo since June was our last chat, Brad. I think that's right. And it's uh, great to be speaking with you again. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be with you. I'd love to be down there. It looks like you're enjoying a good wine as well. Yes, yes. The, um, good drop, but maybe um, I might have a, have, a, have a sip or two while we're chatting now. Absolutely. Um, look, I guess, you know, look, your share price has gone through the roof. Everyone's anticipating um, your diamond drilling. Obviously, that's pretty obvious. Um, maybe give us a, a rundown of, of, you know, what you guys are chasing and remind investors to hang in there to wait for your, your results. Sure. So we are in the Fraser range, which is a nickel province. And in 2012, it delivered a fantastic discovery with the Nova deposit. Uh, since then, there haven't been too many more discoveries. However, Legend Mining, which is around uh, 50 kilometers along strike from where we are drilling, uh, had a, a very good discovery late last year as well. So it did generate a lot more interest in the Fraser range. We are back uh, drilling at the moment. We're completing a diamond drilling program. We've built our targets up over the past 18 months with a number of rounds of air core drilling, RC drilling, ground EM surveying. We've put a lot of time and effort into thinking about where to locate these drill holes and uh, we're in the process of drilling them. So like you said, it has got a lot of investors interested and excited and uh, we hope to have those results over the next month or so. I mean, rightly so too. I think we, when we last we spoke, you mentioned um, your, your conductors were, were really not overshadowed by your country rocks, which you know, I think is a very important point um, that you made before um, that, you know, that I know you can't say it, but the chances of, of, of it being a price is probably higher than, you know, in other areas. Is, is that something that you guys are, are aiming for? I'm, I know vectorizing this kind of stuff can be very hard from, from, from your side, but is that something that you guys are, are sort of hoping for that you, this is more than likely a good target in quotation marks? Definitely. Yeah, so we, uh, last time we spoke, I think we did talk about the false positives that can occur with EM surveying. And because of the amount of air core drilling we've done, we know that there aren't many uh, sulfitic sediments which can provide false positive anomalies. So that doesn't discount it completely, but it reduces the chances of our EM targets been related to those uh, rocks that aren't worth finding. Or another way of saying it is that increases the chances of us being able to identify sulfides through EM surveying. And the next step for us, if we're able to identify sulfides, we already know that some exist in a disseminated form. If we can identify more sulfides, then we need to check the nickel and copper contents to see whether it's economic. So that's one of the main aims of our diamond drilling we are undertaking at the moment is to test the EM targets. Hopefully they are sulfides. And if they are sulfides, then we uh, very much uh, hope and anticipate that they'll be carrying a good amount of nickel and copper. For us, you know, desktop geos who know everything and, and, and you know, everything under the sun, give us an idea of what we're looking at if you're chasing uh, an EM target like the dom I know dimensions doesn't have to be huge for a nickel sulfide deposit. Are you able to sort of suss out the dimensions, the you know, plausible dimensions from these targets? It's quite difficult with EM surveying undercover. So it's a process where a, uh, an electrical charge is uh, put into the ground from surface. The charge goes through the ground, sits in the sulfide, and then comes back up through the cover rock and gets measured on surface. So the measuring process is by nature inaccurate, but it gives you a rough location for the conductor itself. By the time you drill it, you have a much better feel for the potential size. And then from the underground platform uh, of the drill hole, 
we are able to complete downhole EM surveying, which gives us more targets. Uh, but you're right, for a good nickel sulfide ore body, it doesn't have to be very large. It could be of a strike length of two or 300 meters, a uh, thickness of tens of meters, and then a down dip extent of a few hundred meters uh, can give you quite a good tonnage. And also the depth, uh, particularly in the Fraser Range, where the rocks are very competent, anything uh, around 250, 300 meters depth can still be uh, potentially economic because the ground is uh, very amenable to uh, putting in declines. It's not an expensive, uh, relatively inexpensive process to build mines at that depth when you're chasing nickel sulfide, which is of such high value. Obviously, when, when we look at the regional map and of where you guys are, and we've talked about this, how legends there, Nova, everything else, you've got the strike alignment, um, the, I used, I know we spoke about this in some, some detail before, but when you look at the regional extent of your tenements, um, are you, well, how's the thinking? Do you guys think that you know, your tenements are going to be um, endowed with this type of mineralization? Uh, we definitely hope that they are. And when we picked up the tenements from the Creasy Group, uh, we truly believe that they are in some of the, uh, the best positions in the Fraser Range. There's a very large uh, tectonic uh, displacement of the north and southern Fraser Range blocks, and we're right on that uh, displacement. Uh, so what, what that means is that it's an area where there are large-scale deep intrusions. Uh, so there's been very um, deep tapping intrusive rocks that have come up near the surface or near the surface today. And uh, we think that that is a great sign for the prospectivity of our ground. Obviously, as we've just said that, you know, every, all your investors is anticipating re drilling results and everything. What's going in the background that nobody knows or at this point, nobody cares, but is significant in the overall picture of what, you know, Galileo is trying to do. What's, 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 what are you guys working in the background apart from the um, sexy drilling? It's a good point you make because we're always doing things in the background. Uh, the process of exploration takes some time. So these targets that we're drilling now, I mentioned before, took 18 months to build up. At the same time as we're drilling, we are also undertaking large scale EM surveys. So around the Lantern Prospect, we have a number of other intrusions that have been identified through air core drilling. So that's the first step to tell us that the rocks uh, undercover our perspective and we'll go back and which we are doing right now and EM survey those areas, building up the next round of targets. And uh, assuming that those EM surveys deliver us more targets, we'll be back drilling again uh, before the end of the year. And we've also got other prospects in that Northern Fraser Range zone close to that large tectonic fault I mentioned before uh, that we need to do more work on. And that, one of those is called Delta Blues. It's a long strike from another legend mining prospect and also a long strike from an S2 resources prospect. And those guys at S2 resources were the original guys that discovered Nova. Um, so they're back in the Fraser Range exploring now and we have other good prospects, a long strike from theirs and legends. So in the background, we have a huge amount of work going on building up the next uh, pipeline of prospects for further drill testing. I mean, in, as we all know, the, the, the industry is booming, everyone's happy. Um, are you experiencing sort of uh, inability to get enough staff or uh, access to drilling, access to supplies, things like that with the rush that we're seeing? Uh, we're not personally. Uh, because of the way we've structured our company, uh, we've been active in West Australia and in particular the Fraser Range for a long time, over the past 10 years. We've built extremely good relationships with suppliers, drilling companies, and the people that uh, work for Gallo have worked uh, previously for the Creasy Group. We're a very tight-knit team of people. So we haven't experienced any of those issues, but I know that they, you are correct that it is happening in Western Australia, particularly for a field staff and uh, younger geologists are quite difficult to get a hold of at the moment. Okay. I mean, I, I guess, you, you know, you, you, 
don't really need to do a spiel to shareholders by the look of your, your share price share price movement. But you know that moment where you you what would you say to garnish their their attention or you know take them from forty one cents to sixty eighty. <laughs> For us, we have a particularly prospective block of ground. And I know from other examples globally that nickel deposits can occur in clusters. So for us, the ultimate aim, and it is difficult to achieve, would be to make more than one discovery on the ground that we've got. So if we are able to identify sulfide mineralization, which we have, it's disseminated and not of the grade that we could mine yet, but if we can go on to identify higher grade mineralization, then there's every chance that we could come across further deposits within the ground that we have. And that would be fantastic for us. Not just one discovery, but perhaps two or three. Yeah, I guess, you know, nickel is slightly different from the gold industry. You know, you're trying to define and vector yourself into a, a nice little deposit it takes a little bit longer than your normal um, gold expiration, I think, you know, again, coming from a desktop geologist. Would that be, would that be true? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And the main reason is there's not, not a large halo around the mineralization. So in gold deposits, there's alteration, which means that the rocks have been uh, changed through the process of mineralization. So you can look and see there's hydrothermal alteration and it extends some way. With magmatic sulfides, it's a very sharp cutoff between the mineralization and the host rock. So you could be within 50 meters of a high grade mineable sulfide, nickel sulfide ore body, and there would be no indication. It's that tight. So you can be very close without knowing. So it's, uh, it is a, a tricky type of deposit to explore and discover. Okay, Brett, you know, look, it's always interesting to talk because I think nickel exploration, especially what you guys are doing, is, is, is unique and has been for a little while. Um, and you guys are obviously fairly active in this, in this belt and uh, so has the likes of Legend and S2 and Nova. Um, but, um, yeah, thanks for your time. You know, um, always appreciate a good conversation. We, we we need to sort of talk a bit more geology because, you know, maybe your stock would go to a dollar once you start talking about your geology, Brad. I'm not sure people are that interested in the difference between a, a Websterite and a Gabronorite. I'm <laughs> happy to talk about it if you like. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brad. No worries. Enjoy your wine. Yep. Bye-bye.